philosopher Alan Watts wrote a lot of uh, books about Eastern mysticism and spirituality. And uh, Richard Albert and Tim Leary um, asked him to try psilocybin and LSD uh, and some other substances just to see his reaction to it and what he thought about them. And uh, he had ended up writing a whole book about it because his, the insights he gained from these uh, substances was so profound. So I'm going to quote a little bit from a book he wrote called The Joyous Cosmology. Um, and he was basically out in the garden observing the flowers, and this is what came to his mind. I began to feel that the world is at once inside my head and outside it, and the two, inside and outside, begin to include or cap one another like an infinite series of concentric spheres. I am unusually aware that everything I am sensing is also my body, that light, color, shape, sound, and texture are terms and properties of the brain conferred upon the outside world. I am not looking at the world, not confronting it. I am knowing it by a continuous process of transforming it into myself, so that everything around me, the whole globe of space, no longer feels away from me, but in the middle of me. In the world of ordinary consciousness, man feels himself as will, to be something in nature, but not of it. He likes it, or he dislikes it. He accepts it, or he resists it. He moves it, or it moves him. But in the basic superconsciousness of the whole organism, this division does not exist. The organism and its surrounding world are a single integrated pattern of action in which there is neither subject nor object, doer nor done to. At this level, there is not one thing called pain and another thing called myself which dislikes pain. Pain and the response to pain are the same thing. When this becomes conscious, it feels as if everything that happens is my own will. But this is a preliminary and clumsy way of feeling that what happens outside the body is one process with what happens inside it. So what's going on here? Is Alan Watts just playing games with language and uh, being poetic, or is he describing uh, a real uh, experience. Um, you know, that's a good question, of course, but uh, I see the use of psychedelic drugs as both a scientific uh, instrument and as a spiritual exercise. Um, and they don't necessarily have to contradict one another. Um, because this, whenever you have a science of consciousness, the whole point of, of science is to develop first of all an understanding and then a technology or a technique for um, consciously or, or um, um, intentionally altering or changing or manipulating whatever it is that you're studying. So the science of consciousness is going to be a lot like uh, Buddhism or um, Vedanta or some kind of uh, transformative spiritual practice because as you study consciousness you're also transforming it. Because consciousness is not, uh, you, you obviously can't be separate from your own consciousness. So any discovery you make about consciousness is also a repositioning of yourself or, you know, a, a transcending of your former state into some new, more uh, revelatory or more all-encompassing awareness. So a science of consciousness is, is identical to really a spirituality of transformation. And Alan Watts was a big proponent of the idea that these substances should be used responsibly for research and transformation. And, um, you know, the criticism sometimes is that using psychedelics uh, in a spiritual way is sort of like cheating. You know, instead of um, meditating for 20 years to attain enlightenment, you just uh, eat some mushrooms or, or pop some more. LSD on your tongue and all of a sudden you're a, a Buddha. But you know, that's not exactly how it works. It's, it's, these, these substances, from my experience at least, they give you a temporary glimpse at reality. You don't get to stay there. When it wears off, you're right back, you know, to your, in your conceptual, dualistic mind and language and way of thinking and, and behaving and acting with others. And yet, you retain a memory of, of that original 
experience, of that like, transcendent experience of reality itself without these concepts and representations that we use to describe it. And that alters the way you perceive the world forever. And um, while it isn't uh, a sure path to enlightenment or anything, it's certainly, it certainly helps. And uh, it helps by giving you, you know, a glimpse of the temporary state that you're trying to reach as a stage. So in other words, you get to temporarily experience what 20 years of meditation will provide uh, as a permanent, uh, you know, mode of being instead of just this temporary, this temporary ecstasy.